On behalf of the, uh, the British School at Rome, um, I would like to thank very much the sponsors um, who have made this uh, program possible. Um, Marina Engel has been the, uh, the catalyst um, and the mind behind the program. Um, I think, uh, actually, there's, uh, there is an issue of kind of some fragility about the British School at Rome because, uh, on the one hand, it, it's far away, but actually, um, it, it is also uh, easily, therefore, kind of forgotten. But it's, it's an immensely powerful institution in terms of being a place of, of cultural crossover and fertilization between uh, archaeologists, between uh, historians, um, between uh, those interested in society um, and architecture and the visual arts. It's a very extraordinary institution. Um, it has for uh, many decades um, provided uh, scholarships which have been completely unencumbered um, by uh, or untainted by a kind of uh, anything other than the person's desires to, uh, to actually learn from the great city of Rome, so um, an incredibly fertile territory. Um, so it's, it's a very precious place and one that I actually I think uh, that, that stronger links can be made with, um, with the AA. Um, and this is therefore a rather historic moment of coming together. Um, so uh, we'll come to the end with, with the uh, list of sponsors, but let's start <coughs> with Cities in Flux and, and Bob and Graham with their presentation. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm uh, Graham Morrison. I'm going to share this 10-minute slot with my partner, Bob Allies. Um, uh, we're going to do a quick canter through um, some of our London master plans. Our, our city, of course, is London. And um, uh, so I'm going to show you very briefly five master plans, if I, one can do that in five minutes. Um, and Bob is then going to uh, explain some of the thinking behind it. Um, now, starting with a project very dear to our heart, 1951, Festival of Britain. And um, here we have the, the, the one part that, that remains, of course, is the Royal Festival Hall. And uh, there, there is a poignancy about this picture because we feel there's a vulnerability about it because this plan never had an urban aftermath. It was never thought of as something that would have a legacy. And, of course, 13 years later, in 1964, um, for the best of intentions, separating pedestrians from cars, the Royal Festival Hall was then ensnared in uh, a series of concrete walkways, um, which effectively stifled it, um, as I say, for the best of intentions. And um, jumping almost to now, um, in conducting the restoration of the Royal Festival Hall and a, and a mini master plan for that area, um, we've, we've achieved a series of connections, public spaces, and established um, the, the new route from Charing Cross to Waterloo. Um, now, that, that in a way, the connections is a theme of what we do. Um, this is a photograph of, in fact, where our office now is, believe it or not. Our office is in that empty site just there. Um, and, and this is the the old St. Christopher's House, and many of you will recognize this as um, uh, Tate Modern. Um, and of course, it's missing the bridge, which goes to St. Paul's. Um, but we, we've gradually been redeveloping the area south of um, Tate Modern, and of course, linking with the various initiatives that are going on. So that's a plan of a master plan that's been dreamt up effectively by a, a series of private institutions so on the one hand, you had the initiative of the bridge. Then the Tate is going to be open during the day um, when it completes the southern extension. Then there's the Bankside 123 development. And then there's our office, which will link through to a series of capillaries down to Union Street. So a new route from sort of locked into Southwark all the way through to St. Paul's will have been formed simply by a series of people joining up their thinking. 
Um, similarly, um, this is the BBC uh, White City, and uh, before we got started, that's the A40 motorway, and this was the BBC's original building, and the White City estate. And on this, um, that's that building I was just talking about here, and we built a couple of large office buildings and then proposed a number of smaller buildings, some of which were built. But the main thing is, is that there's a new route from the White City Estate that connects through to, um, to the underground station. And um, in so doing, produces a street that didn't exist before and really reminding us that the space between buildings is as important, if not more important, than the buildings themselves. Um, I hesitate to say anything about the Olympics because it's such a vast subject. Uh, this is, you can't take a current photograph of the Olympics because it's out of date the next day. But, so this is, this is quite out of date, as you can see, but a view from the north. Um, we've turned the drawing round here. Um, this is the, uh, north is, is to, the, to the left, um, so the Thames is to the right. But this is the image of the Lee Valley and the Olympic site before anything was conceived, basically a, a whole series of industrial sheds along some derelict waterways. Um, this is the image of the games, and I'm not going to say anything about this now, really, but for the fact that the intention has been to place most of the major events in such a way that it anticipates a future um, that, that can happen beyond it unlike the master plan for the Royal Festival Hall and the great ex the exhibition of 1951. So the, the legacy that we talk about of, of the Olympics still has retained within it these major buildings of the velodrome, the aquatics, and the Olympic Stadium, and a few others. But essentially, there is a new urban pattern which replaces something that was a, a sort of rip that was taken through the city of industrial wasteland, now becomes a park which is then joining up two parts of the city that were originally divided. And unseen in that is, this is drawing the same way up again, um, this is an analysis of the, the roads that link the east and the west, which is the top and the bottom. And in fact, there's, there's only one road really um, here, Carpenter's Lane, that manages to actually link through the east and west before the Olympics idea came along. And if you contrast that with that drawing, it shows that that, in fact, is the real legacy because the buildings come and go, but the roads tend to stay in its place. And you know, we liken this to the blood supply in the skin, that this, this was a scar that is now reinvigorated. Um, and then uh, my last one is, is really to talk about King's Cross, um, an extraordinary inheritance of industrial... Um, uh, an industrial legacy with, with the canal running through it and um, what, what, is, what is now um, uh, the art college here and um, soon to be blocks of flats within the gas holders and so on. Um, but ag again, I've turned the drawing irritatingly the wrong way around, so that's now, that's now facing south and west is to the top of the page. Um, but that's the um, King's Cross site with uh, King's Cross and St Pancras stations and Euston Road running through. And the cross-channel rail link was then comes through and connects to St. Pancras, and of course was the thing that then released the land uh, for redevelopment. Um, its history, uh, I mean, there's an amazing history which you can't go into now, but essentially there were three major buildings built, King's Cross, um, the, the, the um, Bob, what's that called? The, the yeah, the, gran the granary and the transit sheds, thank you, which linked to the canal. Um, and then that was in, 18, in the 1860s. And then by just before the turn of the, um, the century, there was King's Cross. Here is St. Pancras. That's where the British Library is. And you can see, basically, this was the Heathrow Airport of, of London, which, of course, then moved to Liverpool um, for, for, the, for the ferries and the ships. And, and these sites then just, just keep being turned over. So the master plan is very simple. It um, produces a setting for uh, the canal and all of the listed buildings and the buildings that are kept. It makes a very simple series of connections, dividing the site into four and then subdividing it again into a series of subordinate blocks. It establishes the, um, the landscape 
um, between the buildings and then it sets the limits for the blocks themselves so that um, looking closer in the thing that will remain for decades and maybe hundreds of years will be the public realm but the thing that will, will constantly change will be the intricacy of the block and indeed as, as the master plan has developed itself and buildings come forward none of these blocks are now the same as, as they were when they were originally conceived. The only rule, we're very much against prescription in master plans, the only rule is one of height that was negotiated with um, the local planners and this is a, <coughs> a supposedly built out scheme but the blue envelope suggests where the, the height that any particular building can get to and if you build higher and one then you have to take the area off another because there's a maximum agreed quantum. But that plus the public space is almost the only rule. The third rule is Argent, who are the developer, have to hire really good architects because without it any city will fall apart. And um, now turning the drawing round the other way, so the north is at the top of the page, and of course this is the A to Z, here's King Cross and St Pancras and the British Library, and the A to Z preceding the um, regeneration of King's Cross, and, and then how we imagine it afterwards and, and in many ways that's all we offer out of master plans which is a seamless continuation of the city. Bob. Um, when we were developing material for the exhibition in Rome uh, as well as showing really King's Cross and the Olympics we also thought it'd be helpful to try and articulate some of the principles really that, that either we had followed in carrying out these master plans or indeed had kind of begun to understand as we were working through them. So as part of the exhibition we had these series of 12 posters with slogans which were identifying specific uh, ideas really that we wanted to uh, frame in, in the exhibition. Uh, when, I, when we looked at them, to look at them now, I suppose what comes out of, out of that is that some of them are really, what they're really concerned with is, is our view of what makes a good city, if you like, the qualities that good cities have and therefore the qualities that we would like to replicate within our master plans. But um, some of them are, are not really that. Some of them are more to do with ma the master planning process itself and the sorts of issues which we think are very important uh, within that process. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just really spend 30 seconds or so just talking about four of those issues which are important to us. So the first one, to, which is really to do with the reality of the present, and I suppose the thing to say there is that a, the, the whole purpose of a master plan, of an urban master plan, is actually to, to make it easy for people to proceed, to make the first move, to build the first building. So it's very important that, um, uh, that the, the, the master plan gives gives uh, whoever is carrying out the project sufficient confidence to begin to make that first move. And therefore, one of the critical issues is, is actually the, the plausibility of the buildings that you propose. So we're very keen that within our master plans, the individual buildings are tested, we understand the typology, and uh, we build the master plan out of those so that we have some confidence that people can, can proceed indeed and build the buildings. The second sort of move, move in terms of the process of the master plan is to do with what, the master, what context the master plan then provides. And we tend to talk about this idea of the master plan providing a surrogate context. In other words, when an individual building then comes forward within the master plan, there is a kind of understanding about the role that building plays within the new urban fabric, the obligations it has, what its neighbors will be like, and therefore allows the designer if you, to begin to imagine how his building, might, his or her building, might be produced, but also to allow all the myriad of people who are caught up in assessing buildings, deciding what should go ahead, also to understand that building in this in this virtual context, which the master plan provides. The third one, process not product, is really just to say that we th we also critically feel that. Uh, there's a big difference between a master plan and architecture. You know, the master plan is not, doesn't have that um, uh, single-minded quality that a good building might have. The whole purpose of a master plan is that it's setting forward a process. And it has to therefore have considerable uh, open-endedness, considerable flexibility within itself. 
and particularly when all our master plans in the end involve many architects contributing. So it's not just us who are going to design the buildings in most occasions, it's a series of different architects. So again, we resist in our master plans, we resist geometries or dependencies between buildings that will constrain individual architects too much. We try and find a kind of looser urban grain which will allow individual architects to work in the future. And then the last one, which is the uncertainty of the future, is, and it's a point that Graham has already mentioned, but I suppose we also feel that a master plan, you know, we're, we're doing it now, it, it's going to take maybe 20 or 30 years to evolve. King's Cross took 10 years to, before it started, from when we started work to the first building starting to be built. It's probably a 20 or 25 year process. So it, it is a long process, but even beyond that, we feel that master plans, in the way they work within the city, have a kind of obligation to keep that um, open-ended quality. In other words, we'd like to think that within the master plans we produce, you can demolish buildings, you can replace buildings in 60 years' time without in any way um, compromising the working of the city roundabout. And that re what that really means is being very clear about the distinction between buildings and infrastructure and not beginning to confuse the two. If you confuse the two, there is a real danger in cities that actually the city begins to die because change is impossible and cities really live off the process of change. Thank you. And I will show you this uh, work that is part of uh, an exhibition. And thanks uh, to Marina and all the British Academy for uh, the uh, starting point of this uh, work. That uh, is uh, part uh, a book that is partly a series uh, of projects and uh, projects that uh, are uh, uh, going to be built uh, or are just uh, uh, in the center of the political discussion of this period uh, of uh, uh, debate uh, in uh, Milano. So, sorry. Okay, I start with a piece uh, that I wrote with uh, Stefano Boeri uh, about uh, the, the relation between the landscape and the urban uh, body of uh, uh, the contemporary U European city. And this is about uh, the fact that the city, the nature and the cultivated areas of the countryside are no longer able to occupy wide open areas without compromise and without uh, a series of annexation crossover which over the last 30 years have completely transformed the, Im the image of of a landscape divided into big homogeneous sections. The urban sphere, as you can see in this uh, aerial view of Milano, has expanded, pushed by industrial decentralization and the search for land where low density housing can be built. This sphere has split up into thousand fragments which have also taken in large part a large part of the countryside and the natural world. The rural sphere has been eroded by the unchecked growth of the city and it has re reduced into large monocultural areas which use form of intensive cultivation and are lacking of biodiversity and, uh, in, uh, uh, and of life variety. And the natural sphere encircled along the coast uh, and the hill areas uh, by the growth of the man-made spaces has been reduced in many cases to a kind of a theme park, but it uh, has found uh, an unexpected opportunity for growth in the de-industrialized area in the cities 
where it has managed to re reestablish itself with a small, wild and uncontrolled presence. Like the title, in a kaleidoscope, uh, because the contemporary European landscape, uh, we can say that looks like an enormous kaleidoscope. Uh, and uh, we can say that uh, these uh, three spheres uh, are uh, uh, fragment of a surface area which is in a continual movement. So Bio Milano is uh, uh, taking these uh, three categories uh, of uh, natural, urban, and uh, um, uh, rural to uh, create uh, a vision of the future of the city in which Milano is uh, uh, at uh, a crossroad, a contemporary crossroad, that uh, can continue growing by eating uh, the agricultural land, the wood, the natural space, uh, and uh, reducing the biodiversity and the space uh, available for other species, or it can choose to become a biodiverse metropolis, starting with a new agreement between the city, the natural world, and the agriculture. So Bio Milano, what is? Bi Bio Milano are six projects that we choose, that are not all made by our studio, but are uh, researches of student, uh, um, uh, concept plan made by advisory board uh, of important architects, uh, or uh, simply uh, professional work, that uh, tries uh, to, 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 to give you the idea of this state of transition uh, of the city. And Bio Milano provides a vision of the city which stops expanding into rural areas and chooses to grow by regeneration and by increasing the presence of natural and biological space. Bio Milano ha has it heart, uh, the, uh, it's has, uh, sorry, has uh, in its heart uh, the idea of a new kind of agriculture with, which surrounds the city and provides work and produces food for uh, local uh, market, uh, f of local um, uh, agro-food market. And Mio Milano uh, allow nature to find spaces where it can express form of biodiversity, both inside and outside the city border. Bio Milano is a political project which aims to increase the number of businesses which, uh, working together in areas linked to agriculture, forestation, and renewable energies, can regenerate the urban economy and provide form of integration and work for thousands of citizens. Six projects outline the economical and territorial energies which are needed in order to arrive at a new balance between the urban sphere, the rural areas, and the natural world. So I, I briefly show you this uh, project, but uh, what is important is that uh, uh, Stefano Boeri, that is uh, the, the main partner and uh, who uh, created the network of people that did uh, this uh, different project, now has a direct political role in the life of the city. And uh, uh, in the last two years, he decided to, to run, and now he's uh, Mm, uh, like uh, the assessor, deputy, the tep deputy for culture, design, fashion, and those who he was about Expo in Milano, he's not yet. Because uh, you can, he's not yet uh, anymore. Because uh, uh, this uh, um, project uh, that now I will show you as the first project uh, is uh, really in the center of the debate. So you can see this book that was made before his political uh, decisions. Uh, you can see it uh, as a manifesto, but also like a promise uh, of uh, some political uh, uh, politician, because now he's directly into the political life of the city. And this project uh, that uh, starts like architectural project became in the newspaper like the central debate uh, on the future of the city. So it's very important uh, for, for us to understand we, which are the main points. So Expo 2005 uh, was made a uh, concept plan uh, with the architectural advisory board uh, with uh, Jacques Herzog, uh, uh, Ricky Bardet, who is it here. Uh, Stefano Boeri, uh, William McDonough, 
and uh, this uh, project uh, is uh, uh, the um, trial to create uh, a new uh, exhibition. We don't have time to explain it uh, in detail, uh, but I only tell you that the plan for uh, Expo 2015 uh, will see an area of empty land uh, to the northwest of the city of Milan, transformed into a huge planetary kitchen garden. Unlike past expos in this uh, uh, event, every country will have, uh, he's uh, not starting the video, but it doesn't matter, uh, this event, uh, um, every country, in this event, the every country will have some land which they can use to grow things and demonstrate their use of biodiversity, their use of te technology and the solution they have come up with uh, in order to meet the problem linked to the food and the production of food. Taking in consideration that the title of the expo is Feeding the Planet Energy for Life and we thought that is uh, central uh, to put the, the theme in the center of the project uh, and to create a direct experience for the people who will go there and uh, to uh, um, create also a new kind of uh, monumentality we can say that is made by big elements of landscape uh, sorry this is the site uh, and uh, the decision uh, that was made was to create a big uh, channel of water that is giving quality and is also subdividing the site to the uh, external areas that are really uh, densely infrastructured. And uh, uh, this is uh, like a big infrastructure in which there are four main elements uh, after uh, a cardo and decumano that are the first point of uh, rational sign of a city Today, this is an agricultural field. So we create uh, a cardo and decumanos, like the first sign of distribution, but uh, the main elements are landscape elements. Uh, so the channel, one lake, one hill, uh, a theater that is uh, like um, a landscape, uh, a land uh, uh, art uh, opera, and uh, uh, to push at maximum the uh, uh, the fact that we want to maintain uh, the, uh, a new kind of monumentality that is not made by the competition between countries of uh, the richest, uh, the bigger, uh, uh, and the more most expensive uh, pavilion, but uh, we want uh, that uh, each country show their food culture, creating a food chain, and. Uh, this uh, uh, approach uh, take uh, the, the, um, the decision to use the open field and not uh, just uh, to create a pavilion with the videos and the all of this multimedia uh, stuff that uh, you can see in your computer or in your mobile phone, but we want to create a direct experience of uh, the food for the visitors. So, yeah. But uh, my intention was not to speak about all the project. It yeah. was uh, just uh, to, to, to describe this uh, as a really strong yeah. uh, po political and critical project uh, that uh, uh, was uh, quite innovative uh, because uh, each country was facing uh, this, uh, the, the boulevard at the same, uh, wi without a hierarchy of rich countries and poor countries uh, in a central boulevard. But, uh, the important thing is that uh, this project uh, that was uh, really, uh, I don't know what's happening, uh, well uh, uh, approved by the city and the uh, architects uh, in Italy and not only, after uh, some months uh, was under really the um, discussion of the uh, building power of the city who are saying, what is an expo without building a uh, thousand of square meter of concrete? And uh, it's not possible to think in an exhibition that uh, create a good, uh, attractive uh, place without building a huge pavilion with uh, gold facade and so on. 
And so now the debate is exactly this, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, were planning, uh, uh, I'm just simplifying the question, but uh, we were planning uh, a project uh, that maximized the use of the landscape uh, and uh, a light architecture, a light ar architecture, but now it seems that is not possible because the economic uh, world say that is not sustainable and it is better to build many concrete pavilion in this place uh, and uh, maybe because the banks uh, are giving money if you say that uh, you build many square meter of concrete. So this is the center of the debate of these days in Milano, in th of this period, and uh, I think it's important when we think in the future of the city to take in consideration that uh, the way in which we, we were uh, planning uh, the, 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 the debate on the city on the last uh, uh, 20 years, no? maybe was uh, uh, connected uh, to the uh, economical uh, mm, uh, dynamics <coughs> that uh, produce uh, the great economic crisis uh, of these days. And so now we see that uh, if uh, we have, uh, uh, I go fast with the other project because I, I think that the, an exhibition and six projects are not possible to, to, to explain it in 10 minutes, so I go re really fast. But all of these projects are really based on the approach that we use uh, the economical forces uh, that uh, create uh, some uh, uh, big transformation of the on the cities uh, to uh, think in a long term transformation of the city that uh, is uh, uh, creating a transition of uh, Milano to uh, as I were saying before to a city that uh, is a uh, becoming a biodiverse metropolis so uh, this is the Bosco Verticale that is really uh, a project that uses uh, these economic forces of the market because they are housing for rich people, but we use that uh, economic forces to uh, create a manifesto in the center of Milano that uh, uh, is uh, uh, that is uh, um, building high density tower with the trees. Uh, and uh, what is surprising you, maybe, is that this, that is a visionary project, uh, is uh, that was one of the most visionary project, is the only project uh, that is going to be built. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a concept of uh, architecture that demineralizes uh, the urban areas uh, and uh, uses the changing shape uh, of the form uh, to live uh, well. I mean, is uh, really a, a symbol, but, but at the same time, we use uh, the same uh, um, process of design to create a wood house that cost uh, 1,200 euros for square meter, so really cheap, uh, taking the woods uh, from the mountain, uh, from the Alps, uh, to create a prefabricated house that can be uh, um, is like an object of design that at the low density uh, um, uh, that uh, from the Alps and uh, the maintenance of the wood uh, create all the economic chain to uh, build the housing maintaining the wood and uh, at uh, a low cost uh, um, uh, target uh, uh, and uh, has the same design approach of Bosco Verticale. And all of these projects, uh, I were just, the point is that we use all of these uh, strong uh, economical forces that uh, take the city to some direction uh, of the contemporary uh, world that now we, we have uh, many doubt about uh, this uh, because of the economical crisis. All of these projects are trying to see in a long term uh, distance uh, because uh, are taking into consideration not only the uh, anthropologic, uh, anthropocentric uh, point of view on the city but are also building uh, environments. 
this is an example of uh, well, uh, um, decontaminizing uh, the pollution, uh, planting uh, uh, some uh, some uh, some plant that during 20 years are going to clean the the big pollution areas in the city, and all of these projects are good are going uh, somehow to proceed uh, with different time. And uh, it's interesting to know that in Milano are happening uh, all of this uh, thing, I think. Thank you. We'll, we'll pick it up in the debate. That's yeah. very clear. Thank you. Who's that? My name is Reinier de Graaf. I'm a partner in the um, Office for Metropolitan Architecture. Sorry, it's better. Hello, my name is Reinier de Graaf. I'm a partner in the Office for Metropolitan Architecture. And I would like to give a short uh, summary of what our contribution was to the program uh, of Marina, Three Cities in Flux. Um, our contribution was neither about these three cities and even less about flux uh, in many ways. Instead, our contribution was about stagnation. Uh, stagnation as an integral part of uh, our, uh, our, our profession. The title of the contribution was On Hold uh, as, as the kind of cruel euphemism uh, that, that sort of keeps hope alive for architects and clients alike that their shared fantasies, even though nowhere near materializing, and, and precisely at the moment when they're probably furthest away, are, are about to happen, or at least in a state of temporary suspension. Um, the contribution to uh, the program consisted of an exhibition uh, and a lecture, and it was constructed in such a way that actually neither made sense without the other. So tonight, I'm, I'm in a sort of medley, uh, gonna, gonna try to show how the two uh, relate to each other. So I'll begin with a, a kind of summary of the talk I had. Um, this doesn't, yeah. Um, February 8, 2009, 10 o'clock in the morning. This is our largest building uh, to date, China Central Television, uh, here in the foreground. In the background, uh, there is TVCC, a large hotel, uh, as part of the project. Uh, this is 24 hours later, uh, February 9, uh, 10 a.m. in the morning again. A big, uh, that night had been Chinese New Year and illegal fireworks had basically brought the building in the back uh, to ashes. And of course that's not very nice, uh, but at the same time it's a very interesting wake-up call. Uh, it's a very interesting wake-up call for a profession uh, in the assumption that it's dedicating itself to eternity that its efforts can be extremely ephemeral and that it takes one wrong firecracker to bring them down. Um, moreover, this is the proposed schedule when we started. The building started in 2003, uh, a very optimistic schedule that the entire thing, including the interiors, would be complete before July 2008 when the Chinese Olympics were done. Uh, this is a later schedule. It runs off the slide. Uh, um, it also runs off the current moment, but I think even the timing of this lecture means that already this schedule is a lie as well. But nevertheless, it is built. And as such, it features very proudly along an enormous list of projects that our office has done in the 25 years of its existence. Most of our projects do not get built. And it's precisely those projects that the exhibition in, in Milan was dedicated to. It was a deliberate, uh, exhibition in a way dedicated to failure, or at least what is assumed failure in a profession that is dedicated uh, to build. But it was very important for us to talk uh, about failure, precisely because our profession is so dominated by the urge to, bo to boast about its uh, successes. So um, in a way, 
uh, the exhibition, it's, it's, this is the list of, of all our efforts that never went anywhere. It's essentially 75% of all our projects. I don't know whether that's a good or a bad score. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, 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 assume, I, I assume this happens in the best of families. Um, but nevertheless, this is where these projects are located. I think, uh, uh, so uh, this is where this project list is distributed across the world. This is the way the world is ranked by the United Nations. White is developed as you go progressively darker. It is uh, less developed according to a human development index. But it means that our uh, projects are spread across three continents, but they're also very much spread across different degrees uh, of development, which means that even if you have a vast body of unrealized work, uh, if not anything, it's at least an interesting way to take the temperature uh, of the world, because at least you work in very, very many places, and often it's the anecdotes uh, that you come across in these places that are, are the end product by, by default. Um, the world is changing. Uh, this is what we find, particularly when working in the domain of master planning, 1950, the 10 largest city, with the exception of, of, of Shanghai uh, and, and Tokyo, all located uh, in, in the West, uh, generally rich cities. 2020, uh, not that far away, Tokyo, the only rich and quote unquote Western city left in the top 10. Uh, the primacy of the metropolis, if it was at all at one point a Western invention, the primacy of the metropolis, the metropolis is now a property of the third world. Therefore, it is associated with an entirely different series of propositions. It's associated with uh, problems. It's, it's, it's not associated with uh, wealth anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that also constitutes, in a very strange way, uh, a, a different condition for our discipline, particularly in the domain of master planning. It also constitutes, uh, in fact, it should constitute an enormous amount of responsibility and utopianism. Uh, in our profession. We used to have utopias, uh, 1925. Today we have the market economy uh, that has taken the place of, of utopianism. And even though one could say with a little bit of imagination that the second image uh, is, is indebted to the image before more than it would ever care to admit, uh, and, and even though the formal language of the former image has found its way into many of our current efforts, uh, the utopian charge of the previous image is entirely rejected, to the point that anyway the current moment rejects utopias. It rejects blueprints. It, re it rejects methods to construct the cities. And not only uh, does it reject methods, it actually also <coughs> rejects a lot of efforts that are charged with a certain amount of utopianism. This is the sort of list uh, that was shown uh, in the British school, which are all more, all more or less uh, in a dubious state. They've either been cancelled, then they're on hold. Uh, they're either on hold and then they're on hold. Uh, but I mean, they're all master plans which in a way are in a heavy state of, of, uh, of uncertainty. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a, a little tour. Uh, this was in 2005. We started to work in, 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 in Dubai, uh, in a way happily joined in uh, the exuberance many ways that was prevailing there with bits of sort of corrective uh, urbanism with kind of modest efforts to propose a more sustainable alternative in a city largely dominated by growth and, and by the speed of growth, waterfront uh, city, uh, an effort of Nakil close to uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, later on, uh, uh, a city in, in Ras al Khaima a much less developed emirate uh, further to the periphery, uh, closer to Iran, closer to Oman. Um, actually a proposal for uh, an almost entirely pedestrianized uh, sustainable city centered around two valleys in the desert which you know, for a couple of months of the year actually turned green. Uh, uh, an idea that somebody else fancied uh, to a large degree. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a mountain uh, resort uh, in that same emirate, actually at a very great uh, height, there where the temperature on average was about 15 uh, degrees colder than in the rest of the, uh, the emirate. Now all of these remained uh, virtual. That's why the exhibition generally uh, 
with more than a bit of ironic charge, actually took in our form the form of an art exhibition, uh, where in a way these uh, proposals, which were you know, by default doomed to remain virtual, retroactively were supplied with a type of originals that they never had. Of course, they were all virtual in the sense that they didn't happen. They were virtual in the sense that they were all drafted in the computer, in the virtual space of the computer. And here, uh, the exhibition took the character, if they were old drawings, uh, charcoal drawings actually dusted up from a kind of an old <coughs> art archive, thereby giving the whole uh, surreal effort a degree of fake authenticity, which uh, seemed kind of vaguely appropriate for an institution like the British uh, School. Um, that's the mountain resort, that's along the steps, in the, the, the linking the two spaces. This is in the other space, this is the Dubai uh, project. Uh, this is the Ras al Khaimah project at the far end. Uh, this is actually another project we did in, in Russia, another detour. Uh, this is a master plan we have made uh, for uh, Skolkovo, uh, which is a science city, uh, pretty much uh, in a way in the tradition of science cities as they were produced for a long time uh, in Russia. A kind of Silicon Valley uh, on imposition uh, by the Kremlin uh, a city which is meant to be built at enormous speed, meant to be the showcase uh, of, of, uh, of, of state-of-the-art technology, of sustainable technologies, is meant to attract companies uh, to, to reside there in a way to give Russia a kind of high-tech equivalent uh, to, to California. Um, in a way, the interesting thing was that California uh, Silicon Valley featured very aggressively as a metaphor, even in the Russian uh, discourse. Uh, we thought that was in a way uh, uh, sad, precisely because Russia actually has a long series of science cities, which are actually not the result of conditions, but the result of very deliberate uh, planning. Um, so that's the center uh, as it was designed in it. Uh, that is a number of people looking at the center uh, designed in it. Uh, that's still uh, that's still <coughs> going. Uh, London featured in the exhibition quite prominently as well. So it's not uh, that was actually the city uh, on the list that did feature. But London also featured uh, in 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 the exhibition, not so much as a city, but more as a kind of uh, case, uh, as a kind of clinical case of of uh, of of and and a, and, and a city with a very particular relation to master planning. There we go, London. Uh, the project that featured in the exhibition was a project we worked on for a long time in, in White City. Uh, green light for a great western <coughs> canary uh, wharf. Uh, the location uh, close to the premises of the BBC that uh, Graham showed earlier, a track of land immediately adjacent, which was meant to be in a way the last in a necklace, in a, in a chain of developments that encircled London and in a way, all, as you see here, labeled a kind of Western Canary Wharf. Uh, this is a, a large track of actually strangely industrial land relatively in the center of London. This is the border <coughs> of, of uh, Kensington and Chelsea. This is Hammersmith on this side. So also bordering an area with a fairly large land values in a, in a strangely underutilized way. Uh, the then mayor, uh, of course, endorsing the whole thing with what is called an opportunity area framework. Uh, by the end of this decade, this is a statement from, I think, 2003 or 4, the White City Opportunity Area transformed into a thriving new mixed use urban point with the highest quality of the strong, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was the area, January 2005, before we started. Uh, this is the area, uh, I suspect, the way it looks uh, today in spite of the rhetoric. Um, something happened, in, uh, and this is uh, the current mayor, which has also launched an opportunity area framework for future development. So in a way, uh, the efforts of the previous mayor resulted in a brief for the new mayor to do exactly the same thing round, and, and these things happen. Um, this is not to say, I say this without any bitterness, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But in, in many ways, it is, it is symptomatic of what, what happens here, and the fact that stagnation, indecisiveness, and, and, and the real stamina that
that is actually linked to, to master planning is, is pretty much a universal uh, phenomenon. This is September 2007. The master plan at its peak with the largest possible uh, land uh, at its uh, disposal. <coughs> and what the exhibition shows is in a series of 13 uh, steps. Actually, it shows particular moments when actually the area that we planned either increased or decreased and eventually disappeared. Uh, and and, and uh, underneath it is a, is a kind of small little increments of text, which actually are excerpts of a diary that kept track of that whole thing uh, mm -hmm. happening. Uh, there you go. It's sort of as boring as possible. In a sense, kind of repetitive, minimal art with increments of change. It's the audience. <laughs> well, I clearly do not deserve to be here because I didn't produce anything for Marina's exhibitions in Rome. I was only invited as a sort of discussant, and I, the only time I refused to go and discuss was the, when there was the Roman project there, but I more or less knew them. So I want to say very, very, but I want to thank you, Marina, and the British Academy and the AEA for organizing this very interesting Think that it comes out as a good platform, as a good table to discuss things which were not uh, maybe the things that Marina was thinking in the beginning, but that they're coming out about this role of architecture and, ar and architects and, and cities and designing the cities. So I will say very few, very few things. It wasn't, it wasn't clear in the beginning how to compare Rome, London, and Milan because they're very different cities and especially, as we saw today, the speed and the pragmatism in which transformation goes in these different places is really, really far away one from each other. But then we have we had a new director in Italy, not a movie director, but a prime minister, which is not so not Monty Python, but Maya, Mario Monti. And Mario Monti came to help me uh, two days ago when he denied support to the Ital Italian candidacy to the Olympics. So Italy is not anymore, Rome is not anymore a candidate to Olympics. And so what, 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 what in this, why is this linking to our discussion? Because Monti said he was analyzing very attentively the previous uh, episodes of Olympics and he, w and he spoke about Athens, of course, because Athens, the Olympics were the beginning of the beginning of the end, but he also spoke about London. He said it's not even London is sure that it will be able to do things and stay in budget in the end. So he, he jumped on our time. And the, other, and the other point that was made implicitly by Monti, which is probably having to do also with Milan, he was kind of denying something we've been very much used to. So the possibility to transform cities through the big events, no? the Olympics, the Expo, the big fairs, at least in Italy. So this, there are two, at least two topics which are very much close to our, uh, to our discussion. And where Monti and our discussion comes together is the, about the idea of transformation of mass cities. Rainier was showing uh, the transformation in the hierarchy of metropolis. Metropolis grow through mass growth. No? So Europe and, and the Western world is not growing through mass growth anymore. And when, when, and when uh, Western cities were growing massively, architects would, were used to design the future through massive housing for the people. So this is what we are lacking, and this is why we are in, uh, questioning ourselves about our role today. Um, so, and in fact, in the, in the Italian tradition, in the European tradition, design, urban design was the design of big urban neighborhoods for people, and, and that was the task. We saw today that, you know, housing, uh, not public building, are kind of implicit, but not exactly the real prime task of this discussion. Uh, how, how can we see this through the three cities? Uh, I mean, I see the, the work, the beautiful work uh, proposed by Alison Morrison as uh, 
a proposition of a new utopia. I mean, in, in, in our discipline, in our tradition, urban design and pragmatism are two opposite poles. Urban design was the uh, total denegation of pragmatism. You have to tell people where to live, how to live, which, which geometry, which perspective, which relationship between public and private. And people have to accept, which is exactly what did not happen in Italy and why Italian architects are so badly positioned in the society. Prague in, in London is a city which has been growing with not real big plan no, for its growth. Uh, which is growing on this idea of pragmatism. So maybe this is a discussion we can do in the future. Can, it, can, it, it, can we talk about something like a pragmatic urban design, which is what we have seen? Uh, what the first impression I had, and which is still what I have, this is a condition where we have a lot of satisfaction and maybe less excitement, you know, because excitement is postponed to a second time when uh, your buildings become buildings where the new architects come and so on and so forth. Um, in Milano, we saw a different condition. In Milano, we, we, uh, there is this kind of cynical or pessimistic attitude that we have in Italy, in which we do not believe in urban design anymore, and we're looking for different devices. Um, the devices which were showed by Michele, which are proposed by Stefano in the last years, is this idea of uh, bio, urban agriculture, um, the green presence in the city. And I see one good thing and a, a one bad thing in this. The good thing is, is that it is clearly an alternative thing. It's the idea of redesigning the city through one specific approach and using it as an alternative uh, manifesto, no? utopistic approach. The bad, the bad impression I have, I mean, I'm, I'm maybe more cynical than the average Italian architect, but I was discussing this issue with Michael Sorkin in New York. As you know, Michael Sorkin is obsessed with this plan, new master plan for New York. He's been designing for the last eight years, and he will design probably for the next two. But then I, then I asked him, so what, what's, the, what's the result? I mean, he, he considered the city frozen today, no more buildings, using all the open space he has in his plan to cultivate. And, and I say, how much do you cover? And he told me 2%. So I say, so what is it? What's the point? No? Even building has skyscrapers of, of kitchen gardens. So it is a manifesto, but I would not, really have not understood yet how this manifesto can get into reality and really modify the thing. And also, the difficulties, which are typically Italian, but have to do with, with in, in which the timing and the process and how the six parts are becoming reality now can be a, a point of discussion. In Rome, we saw, you haven't seen Rome, but the Rome project was a typical topic of the Rome architects, which is to focus on this large archaeological uh, area in the Fori and to redo the Fori. I mean, we've been redoing the Fori for the last 100 40 years after De Vico, we did the first design for the uh, archaeological <laughs> area. And the idea was how to connect this large, open air, beautiful museum to the city itself and to make it work be better, and how to connect these 10 million tourists we have every year with the city itself, and so on and so forth. And, and also in this case, I, I see two point of views, possibly dialect directly or opposed. I mean, it's a good idea because. As, as green in Milano, archaeology is a specific topic that could be thought as a, a tool, a device to rethink Rome uh, in, a, in a completely different way, no? to approach the idea of the transformation of the city uh, from a different point of view and using different tools and different devices. But then the, the, the bad part of it for me is wh why, why then only the archaeological uh, central area? Archaeology is so interesting in, in Italy because it is everywhere. Why don't we go look for archaeology in the suburban and leftover areas in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, landscape we have in the city? So, so why focusing on the only place which is already probably the best part? of the city working very well for, or badly for tourists, but then who cares? I mean, it would be, I think, more interesting to use archaeology as an everywhere uh, device to try to rethink a new approach to urban design. So to conclude, I think two are, two are the, the questions I would leave to the discussion. Uh, 
the transformation of the city needs some sort of bulk, no? in its money, in its people who need new housing. Uh, is there this bulk today? Do we have the money to think of it? Do we have to re, as, as Rainier was kind of emphasizing through the failures, I mean, we would be happy with 10% or the failures in Italy uh, of, of, of his office. But I mean, wh where is the bulk? Which is the mass, where, where is the moment when architects and people meet and discuss together their targets and work together and the architect can give answers to the people's questions? And the second question is again, and I, I've been shocked by this also in, in US last week, is this kind of comeback of urban design. Uh, how can we think again the possibility of urban design? We have learned in the last 20 years to live without urban design, no? considering the building as events, or the city as a series of events, or kind of situationistic approach. Maybe the, the three mm, points we saw today are maybe good points to start a discussion about this, and see if there is a possibility to think about the future of the city, but it has to be a very elastic discipline because we will go from cities that we will grow millions and millions every year to cities that will, will not grow, that we only have to regenerate and rehabilitate. And this talks about the ne necessity of being elastic, no? Flex flexible, of our discipline and what we should be actually done in an architecture school. Grazie. Thank you.